Good evening. It is now 6.06 .06 p.m. on August 28, 2017. It's time to call this public hearing and special called meeting of the Board of Trustees of San Felipe Del Rio CISD to order. Ms. Haynes, would you call roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Chavita? Mr. Mesa? Here. Mrs. Martinez Lozano? Here. Mr. Overfield? Present. Mrs. Gonzalez? Here. Mr. Smith? Present. Myself. Thank you, Ms. Haynes. We have a quorum? Yes, sir. Awesome. Let the record show that a quorum of the board members are present in this meeting has been duly called and notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. This time, if you would please stand for opening ceremonies. First, with a moment of silence uh, and remembrance for all of the ISDs in school district affected by Harvey, Rockport, Houston ISD, and the others, and all that is going on in the eastern portion of the state, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. This time we'll move into the public hearing uh, A, 2017-2018 public hearing on the budget and tax rate. Ms. Yanakani Valdez presenting. Ms. Valdez, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Overfelt, Dr. Rios, board members. We will begin with the 2017-2018 San Felipe Del Rio CISD Executive Budget Public Hearing. The public hearing will include the overview of budget projections, the executive budget, which includes the general fund, debt service fund, food service fund, and budget compliance. One of the most important components of calculating revenue for the general fund and the debt service fund is uh, property values. In the last five years, we have experienced an increase to the appraised and freeze adjusted taxable values. Reappraisals of property values are conducted every three years, last reflected in 2013 and 2016 certified values. The 2017 certified values are a 0.59% increase to the prior year. In 1819, we do anticipate that the windmill project will increase the, the taxable value by 200 million, which would be a 12% increase. When we're viewing our property tax, 51% of our, of our property tax is categorized as single and multifamily. Our freeze adjustable tax value is $1,605,743,194. Again, it's a 0.59% increase to the 2016 certified values. When we apply the, our tax rates to the taxable value, the local tax collection for general fund at a tax rate of $1.04 is equal to 17254462 When applied to our debt service fund INS tax rate of 0.1198, this is 2028144 Another very important component in calculating re revenue is our attendance. Uh, as of this past week, enrollment was up to 10,663. Again, most of the growth is in the secondary grade levels. 
Uh, due to the redesign, we believe our secondary instructional programs are being viewed in a positive manner. The 1718 average daily attendance is projected at 9,797, uh, 97 units above 1617's year end at 9,700. We also monitor the average daily attendance for our special funded programs or our special populations. The budget projections from attendance and from our property values were used to build the executive budgets. Again, the executive budgets include the general fund, the food service fund, and the debt service fund. The general fund is the main operating fund of the school district. It is a governmental fund used to account for transactions from ongoing operations and activities and a variety of revenue sources. The general fund portion of the tax rate is $1.04 per $100 of taxable property value. The proposed tax rate reflects no change from the tax rate set for 1516. The general fund revenue is proposed at $84,348,923 or $8,610 per student. 22% of the general fund revenue is attributed to local revenue, which includes our local tax collections. 76.1% is from state funding. Again, the majority of our state funding is based on our average daily attendance and our property values. And 1.9% is from federally funded sources such as SHARs or our indirect cost. The proposed general fund expenditure budget is 84,348,923 or $8,610 per student. The budget for instruction and student support is 78.5% of the budget. For general administration, 3.8%. And for operations, it's 17.7%. When we look at the budget by object code, which is payroll, professional and contracted services, supplies, miscellaneous, any debt or capital, the majority of our budget is included under salaries or payroll, which is at 82.3% of the budget. When comparing the 1718 proposed budget to uh, 13, 14 actual expenditures, we can see that uh, the biggest change has been to um, instructional instruction and student support at 68%. And when you look at it by object code category, as, our, as we have become more efficient on using our budget, the majority of the budget has been allocated as well to payroll. The budget change has been allocated to payroll at 82.5%. Under compensation and benefits, this is guided under DEA local. The compensation plans include teacher, professional, administrative, paraprofessional, auxiliary, and stipend schedules. <clears throat> the TASB salary study was presented at the May workshop. This is the third salary review for our district. We have implemented several adjustments in phases from increasing starting pay for teachers to completely updating pay rate ranges for auxiliary and paraprofessionals as we did in January of 2016. We will maintain a uh, maintenance plan with TASB to continue to analyze our, our salary ranges and structures so that we can uh, remain competitive. In this uh, salary study, there are no changes to the stipend schedules. In this plan, the teacher starting pay will increase by $1,000. Oh, yes, sir. Just because uh, I'm confused, you can explain it real quick. Okay. Um, on the general fund variance, 
um, slide that one there. It says, oh. yeah, right, there we go. The 17, 18 proposed versus the 13, 14 actual. Mm -hmm. How come we use the 13, 14, I guess so far back to compare? How come not something more recent? We were showing as uh, throughout the years we had discussed how we've been um, identifying or becoming more efficient in how we use our budget in prior years uh, at year end we would have uh, favorabilities of up to, I believe it was $5 million. Uh, for instance, in between 13, 14, and 14, 15, and 15, 16, we did have high levels of favorability. And in the 16, 17 year, what we're forecasting as year-end favorability is about $700,000. So again, our budget is being used, is being uh, uh, allocated to where it's actually being used. And in prior years, our budget did not reflect that. So we wanted to show the changes over the last couple of years to show that as we've shifted the use of our budget, it has uh, mainly shifted to instructional and student support and uh, payroll as well. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm sorry, Ms. Valdez. Yes, sir. The, the, last, uh, the last bullet on there is, is important. If we look at the cost of, of the, or not the cost, but where we've allocated the money, 82.5% of the change has gone to payroll and benefits. And I think that sends a, or should send a, a strong message to all our employees. That is, as we've either identified more money or become more efficient in reallocating the money, the largest portion of it has gone to our employees. And I think that was the purpose of, of that uh, of, of that slide, but, but obviously that bullet, I don't want it to go unnoticed. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, did you have a question, Mr. Nelson? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, so I guess at this meeting, we're approving the compensation plans as well. Yes, sir. Uh, the compensation plans that were presented by TAS be at the May workshop. Okay. I know I visited with um, Dr. Rios earlier in the longevity pay. This is for people that are capped? That exceed the maximum salary ranges, yes. Do you happen to have that chart yeah. with the longevity? I, I do have it, not on this presentation, uh, but I can pull it up uh, right after this Would you be able to, if, if you could, for yes. me? Yes. Okay. And, um, unless unless you want me to stop this presentation and, and bring in, in the longevity. Well, because uh, the longevity pay is tied into the compensation plan. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to see a calculator for the teachers, for example, there's something like 12 teachers that are capped. And the longevity pay equals to $292, which is extremely low. I can, oh, it's not coming up. I'm sorry, let me. So my question basically is, where do we get that percentage? Yes, and let me, let me show you where we get that percentage from. Um, I, as soon as I can get this on the screen. Okay, this is the salary range table for teachers, academic support specialists, and reading and dyslexia intervention specialists. So for teachers overall, uh, as, as I was mentioning earlier, that the starting pay is a $1,000 increase. So any employee hired after, was it January 18th? For new employees, 187 employees? Or January 9th? So any, any new teacher with no experience that was hired by the district after January 19th through um, today, their starting pay would be 41550 
an employee who earned a step increase would um, start it last year at forty thousand five fifty, plus they receive a thousand dollar pay increase and a two hundred dollar adjustment, so that the new salary schedules can align. And a new an employee with one year of experience would be at forty one thousand seven fifty. So TASB uh, created a table and adjustments to the table to align the value of each year of experience to the market. So this table would align our employees to Uvalde and Eagle Pass. Now, when you look at the max range, which is uh, step 37 is the max range, an employee who was previously at step 36 and is now at step 37, because they, they've gained a step of experience or a year of experience, will receive a $300 stipend. This $300 stipend, when we apply it to that salary, is 0.47%. And last year, when uh, we created the longevity stipend, we had discussed that we were using the percentage of salary the percentage of a step increase that a teacher that the teacher could receive, which is three hundred dollars, and applying that percentage to all of the pay scales that exceed the that for an individual that exceeds the mark max the max market value. The reason we were using this is because, if you recall, we, this is our third or third salary TASB salary study. And in phases, we adopted the salary plans from TASB, or the recommendations from TASB. Teachers, or the teacher scale, was already at the TASB, um, at the TASB recommended uh, value for each step. And the, the step increases that they were receiving in dollars was less because they breached the max. Now, the other scales hadn't been adjusted. This is the first year that we will have all of our salary scales on uh, what, based on what TASB recommended. So again, in last year, the, uh, for those individuals that um, exceeded the market, their step increase was a lot higher than what a teacher would see. So last year, we recommended longevity based on what a teacher would see as their step increase. Last year's a uh, step increase for a teacher was $200, which was 0.47%. This year, when we're looking at the $300, that's 0.47. That ends up being actually equaling 0.47%. And it was 0.467, you know, but it averaged to 0.47. So we were using the same percentage of what a teacher, um, of what the max rate a teacher would get as a step increase, so that the teachers could continue to get that $300, but applying that percentage to all the others as well so that they wouldn't get a higher percentage when they exceeded the max. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Just to further clarify, this, last year we did pretty much the same thing when we talked about adopting not only the TASB salary matrix, uh, but we clearly indicated that salaries would be capped. Uh, so even though this is the uh, first year that we'll implement the whole salary uh, recommendation from TASB, the issue of capping salaries was already discussed and approved last year. So the fact that there's 11 teachers on there now um, was, was the same, I guess, last year. Uh, except this year, we're doing the $1,000 increase plus um, adjusting the salaries for, what is it, teachers on the first, how many steps? Nine? Adjustments are all the way through step 11. As 11. you can see, this one is 1,030. And then the $1,000 increase uh, is all the way through step 29. And the steps 30 and above, if you, if you recall our salary matrices, at the end of the matrices were the ones that were competitive with the market. Those have the least change. So again, my question was that point Four seven percent was a TASB salary study recommendation. Because my point is, I calculated they're getting two hundred ninety-two dollars. You might say three hundred. It's, it's two hundred ninety-two dollars. But we're trying to keep teachers with experience, and that's not a good incentive to have a 
longevity pay that is equal to $292. Everywhere that I've seen, including the appraisal district, is a lot higher than that. And, and as I mentioned, this is the value of the step increase that the teachers, that this plan includes that a teacher would receive uh, at the max step. And we wanted to make sure that they all maintained the value of the max step, which is $300. That's where the 0.47 comes in. So we, all teachers would see. The, the teachers that are capped, which they're 83, but they're administrators, teachers, paraprofessionals, and so mm -hmm. forth. I think I, something like 12 or 11 teachers. 12. 12. They're the ones that are, are, are getting $292, not the $1,000 because they're capped. That's correct. That's correct. Correct? Yes, sir. They're getting $292. And see, my point is, if we're trying to keep teachers with experience, that's not an incentive to keep teachers with experience. It's, it's quite low. And if we were to increase the longevity stipend, it would exceed what other teachers are, or I say other teachers, but the value of the change in the step for the other teachers. If we were to increase it, we would have to change it for all of the rest of them. No, I, I, I understand that. I just think that if we are going to have an incentive for experienced teachers to stay with us, it's not anywhere near the amount that I myself would like to have it at. The longevity pay, you know, that's 292 before taxes, so they end up getting like $250. And that's, that's quite small, in my opinion, again. I just wanted to express that. And just to mention, we're using the same model as last year so that all teachers received at least the uh, step increases that w is included for the last um, step in the schedule. So that's where the 0.47 comes into place. This, uh, this schedule, again, so that, oh, I'm sorry. Just to clarify, Yanakani, um, cost of living, increases when if ever would that come into play when we look at the uh, when we look at the salary model um, and I see salary model but in general if uh, in, if individuals or salaries are below the market that's where they would see their adjustment when we make adjustments when we recommend increases to the midpoint the other area where individuals would see changes is when the market value increases for that position. So again, it, it would be included in all. However, those individuals that are on the longevity stipend exceed the market value of their position. So if I'm understanding you, for those who have exceeded the market value, they would never be eligible for a cost of living? No, that's, no, 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 that's not correct. Okay. As TASB, uh, with, with the plan we have with them, as they respond uh, to the market, they're responding to the cost of living. So when we, when, after this year, we, we would have our salaries aligned with the market. If, sal if TASB comes back next year and says, okay, so now we have to adjust it because the market went up, mm -hmm. well, then we would, we would consider an adjustment for everybody. We don't know the amounts because we don't know what they would be. But at this point, with the recommendation that TASB gave, we're aligned with the market. So those that exceed the market, their, their cost of living adjustment is covered for now. When TASB comes back and recommends a whole adjustment, then everybody would get something beyond the, the percentage that Yanakani discussed right now. So in essence, cost of living would go out the window However, it would be, be replaced with market value. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and just as an additional note, these uh, schedules that TASB provided, there were 10 individuals who, were, who previously had maxed out on last year's schedules, but now this year's schedules aren't. Okay. So again, so we, we are following uh, that data as well. 
and there's uh, four individuals who um, seek higher employment or employment in higher pay ranges. Thank you. Out of curiosity, we see the we see the pay scale here for teachers that are capped, and the. Not, I can't read it. 700, 600, 500, whatever it is there. Do you have one for the administrative? What those who are capped, how much their their percentage is? Let me. I think I understood your question. Let me show you that a table. So basically, I'd like to see an administrator who's capped and what their, what are we calling it? Their longevity. Their longevity, longevity, longevity. what their longevity stipend's going to be. Okay. So there are 11 individuals that fall under the administrative professional. Their salaries in total exceed the max. The max mark, yes, their max by forty thousand. Had we uh, allotted a step increase, they would have received fourteen thousand in total. However, the longevity stipend is uh, in total would be four thousand four hundred and sixty-nine. There are twelve teachers. Their salaries, and again, their salaries exceed by four thousand five hundred. A step increase would be three thousand six hundred, and the longevity is at three thousand five ten. There are 45 paraprofessionals that exceed the max. Their salaries exceed by 93,720. If we would have awarded a, a step increase, then or a step increase would be at 27,000 or a longevity, or the longevity adds up to 6,600. And in auxiliary, we have 15 individuals. So in total, we have 83 individuals. Their salaries exceed the max by 166,000. A step increase would have added 60000 to that excess. However, the longevity stipend uh, is only at 18000 which is a cost avoidance of $40,000. And um, when compared to last year, this number is reducing. I think last year's excess was about 233000 so we have had individuals that have retired, and we, of course, when when we fill that position, it would be with somebody at a lower salary because they have less experience. So again, we we have seen improvements to this, but <clears throat> as I mentioned, there were ten employees who now fall within the TASB ranges, and then there's four employees who um, decided to seek promotion to higher pay grade positions. Help me understand because yes, I teach history and not math. <laughs> um, you're saying that the, the 12 teachers that are capped right now, if we were to give them a step increase, it would cost us 36, 24? Mm -hmm. um, but by giving them a longevity, it costs us 3510, 3510, which is. Uh, a hundred and fourteen dollars, give or take some pennies here and there. Yes, and this is, um, you know, I want to say this is rounding. Our flat amount is going to be three hundred dollars. It does end up being point four, but I, as I mentioned, it's like point four six six. I mean, it just the decimal points are long, but the teachers will see the three hundred dollars, which is what the value of the last step increase on the teacher matrix shows. So they will see three hundred dollars. Now, I mean, had I had I, had I known we were going to provide this schedule, I would have you know made sure and gone back and detailed it and cleaned it and cleared it so that it was reflecting everything. This was you know just the high level calculation so we could see where we were. And um, but I know that we are providing three hundred dollars for teachers. 
because that is the value of the step increase for the teacher on the last step or that more before they max out. The average general pay increase for the teacher pay schedule is 1.8%, and 1.5% was used for all other district positions. The budget includes a contribution to our annual health insurance plan of $5,279.40 per um, per employee or $439 per employee per month. So again, the annual contribution included in the budget uh, does not have an increase to prior year. It is the same amount. Throughout the year, our health insurance committee has made the recommendation to change the start date of our plan to January 1. And uh, in the presentation following on the agenda, we will discuss what the recommendations are for our health insurance, where uh, we would like to maintain the 2016-2017 plan design, which is the same deductible levels, uh, the same um, copay, the same maximum out-of-pocket, so the same plan design uh, and, uh, and uh, offset with a return to work stipend for the increase in cost. So again, that's a recommendation that will be presented on the, net, on the PowerPoint on the following agenda item. The proposed general fund budget is a balanced budget of $84,348,923 or $8,610 per student. The debt service fund, also called interest in sinking, is the fund used to account for the accumulation of property tax revenues for the payment of long-term debt and principal. This is the, the bond payment schedule where we have adjusted the uh, bond payment total for the 2018 year based on the series 2017 refinancing. The INS tax rate based on our property values, based on the state's share of paying our debt will remain at 1198 again it's the same tax rate as before so there is no increase in tax rate on INS or on MNO the debt service fund includes a balanced budget of 4,094,904 and for the food service budget our district qualified for the community eligibility provision for grades pre-K through A to offer free breakfast and lunch at no cost to the students. Freshmen and high school campuses will remain on the no, um, National School Lunch Program, which offers universal free breakfast and uh, determination of uh, status uh, for the meals, whether they're paid, reduced, or free. The proposed budget for the food service fund is revenues of six million twenty eight thousand five hundred and sixty nine uh, and expenses of six million fifty eight thousand two hundred and eighty two with a projected deficit of twenty nine thousand seven hundred and thirteen for budget compliance the publication of notice of the budget and proposed tax rate was posted or published i'm sorry in the del rio news herald on sunday august 20th the 2017-2018 exec executive budget, which includes the general fund, food service fund, and debt service fund, will be posted on our financial transparency webpage for a minimum of three years. Are there any questions on the presentation of the public of the executive budget? Mr. Russell? Yeah, McCann, could you go back to the health insurance fund? Yes, sir. In the last statement, 
from the health insurance fund. Oops, I think you passed. I'm sorry. The recommendation? No. Um. I don't know if you have a different one from the one that's in our packet. Our packet, the last thing that it says, it's a stipend to auxiliary and paraprofessional staff to offset the first year change. That was uh, from last uh, week's meeting. That was initially what we had discussed. And then after that, I believe, is when we received the stop loss information, so we continued to make recommended changes. OK. Um, I understand it was from the last workshop, but what I want is a commitment. I know that the administration has worked real hard to, to help out auxiliary and paraprofessional and everyone pretty much, but I would like a, a guarantee that this is going to be a permanent fix with no added cost to employees. Mr. President, the presentation that we're going to share with you in the uh, related to health insurance will address uh, the issues. I think that we'll be able to discuss um, a presentation that will absolutely take care of the insurance if that's what the board desires and wishes uh, for the next uh, two years. But we don't know what the health insurance costs are going to be beyond that, so it's always going to be a moving target. Sure. We just have to work as hard as we did this year to identify sources of income and smarter use of the money. But uh, the presentation that will follow will, will clearly give the board an option to maintain the plan uh, for the next two years, and we feel confident that if we meet with the insurance committee every month and discuss other options, we will be able to lower costs. Some are very aggressive options. We've been in contact with uh, other possible um, consultants, and, and we'll flesh those out uh, starting next month. Uh, but what we will present today will give the board an option to sustain the plan for at least the next two years. And hopefully, within the next six months, we'll identify other cost-saving measures that will not change the plan at all, uh, and we'll mention them in a little while, but, but it's just to, so the board knows that we're aggressively looking for other options. Sure. Uh, okay. We mentioned so, them to the committee earlier. I know exactly. I'm not, I served on the insurance committee when I was still employed by the district, and I know that it's something you cannot foresee, but at least if there's a guarantee for, for two years, I and mean, that's good enough for me. Just to clarify on the actual slide you have up there now, 2017-18 annual contribution per employee per month. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just want to make sure we don't really mean that. No. <laughs> Thank you. you mean I, I'll take that a off. total for the year. For the year, yes. Okay. And I'm so used to doing employee yeah. per month that, but it is annual contribution. The per month is 439, but I'll put that in there. Thank you. Any other questions? On, it's probably something I should have asked over a month ago, and I just never realized it or didn't think of it. But when we do the funding for UIL, particularly the middle school, um, you know they have to take yellow buses, and because we don't want to disrupt, um, we don't want to do the disruption of bus routes. Uh, I mean, you can remember back when you were there, I was there, we would leave right after school, but now they leave 5.30, 6 something in, at, um, in the evening because they're using yellow buses. Um, if they, is the reason we don't use charters for them um, because number-wise, the amount of buses, because my argument to that would be football, but just why we don't spend the, the money so we can get them there 
earlier as opposed to, to later like we used to do on charters as opposed to yellow buses? Yes, sir. The, it is cost prohibitive when we look at it. However, uh, on Thursday, we will be recommending to the board uh, a consideration to approve the purchase of um, activity buses that are just one step down from charters. We'll recommend three buses for your consideration. If that's approved, uh, those will be the exact amount of buses that middle school takes on trips. And because it happens after a whole lot of the heavy activities are, that's uh, definitely a consideration that they take the activity buses. Uh, last year we did uh, discuss with the UIL sponsors that for the last tournament, which is a tournament of champions, uh, that as a recognition of their work, we could have them order charge buses ahead of time if they want. And we even allocated some money on the dedicated funds, I believe, Ms. Holmes. It was about, well, last year it was about 12000 About 12000 for one weekend. Um, Did they take them to tournament of champions, or they um, took yellow buses? No. Um, they took yellow buses. I'm trying to recall the conversation. Um, so I don't many. know if it was the... I, I want to say the timing of when they requested the charter buses there weren't any available. I, I, there was a, I had a conversation with Patty Brown, but I don't remember the exact details. Um, but they, they ended up taking yellow buses. Again, I, 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 you know, I understand they take yellow buses, but when we look at the overall commitment per trip, uh, when we talk about hotel rooms and numerous meals, it's a balance. You know, we, we try to give them good hotel rooms, uh, and the, the trade-off is the yellow buses. Now, again, if, if the board considers the purchase of the activity buses, that's absolutely something that can be um, reserved for those UIL trips. Okay. Thank you. I was curious. I said I'd ask. Any other? Anybody else have any other questions on the... Uh, budget as presented this evening so far. At this time, then, it would be um, if you could open it up for public comment. Okay. At this time in the meeting, as per uh, the law and rule on public hearings, in particular for this one, I am going to open it to public comments. If anyone from the public has a comment on the budget and anything that was presented in the budget as well as the tax rate. Is there anyone who, from the public that would like to make a statement? Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Ricardo Rubio. Yo soy pastor de la Iglesia Metodista Unida del Príncipe de Paz en San Felipe. Eh, yo vivo aquí desde el 2008, pero mi familia vive desde el 2010, mi esposa y mi niño. Eh, vivo muy orgulloso de que mi hijo haya terminado el año pasado en el número 14. Gracias a todo el esfuerzo que ustedes hacen y al trabajo que hacen todos los empleados. Eh, yo viví desde el 2001 al 2008 en Nueva York y pensé que mi hijo iba a estudiar en Nueva York, pero las cosas de la vida son diferentes. Y vinimos de Nueva York, me vine por el trabajo que yo hago del Ministerio Pastoral de la Iglesia. Vine a este, al pueblo de El Río, no lo conocía. Y yo creo que es la mejor decisión que la vida ha tomado para nosotros, pertenecer a El Río. Mi emoción es por mi niño. Ahora sí voy a hablar de, de lo que vengo a decir. Quería decir esto porque lo siento en mi corazón y vivo muy orgulloso de Del Río y ojalá me, me entierren en Del Río me siento muy bien aquí sé del esfuerzo que ustedes hacen del trabajo 
Esto es tremendo Todo lo que ustedes hacen Fabuloso, maravilloso Y lo hacen de corazón Y lo hacen por el bien de la vida De los que vivimos en Del Río Al respecto Nosotros, en mi caso Como pastor del Príncipe de Paz La iglesia eh, Puso a disposición Las instalaciones de la iglesia Para escuchar las historias De los trabajadores del distrito en el caso, hablando en este caso de la aseguranza de que los beneficia a ellos que en la seguridad social y escuchando las historias eh, en el caso mío y el de nuestra iglesia el príncipe de paz nos hemos dado cuenta que hay dos planes el plan A y el plan B y nosotros apoyamos el plan B creemos que es el que nos va a ayudar y nos va a beneficiar a todos Así es que nuestra iglesia Yo como servidor de la comunidad Pertenezco a la organización A Border Organization Estoy, Soy estudiante de ellos Tengo 35 años de estar en el ministerio y, y he aprendido muchísimo En lo de Border Organization Para trabajar con la comunidad Así que lo que yo digo Siento que es mi responsabilidad como ciudadano, soy ciudadano de los Estados Unidos y mi responsabilidad con el trabajo en la comunidad y creo que lo mejor es una, una organización sana, un cuerpo sano en todos los sentidos y creo que ustedes están trabajando por eso y como ayuda para las decisiones que ustedes van a tomar, creemos, en nuestro caso en nuestra iglesia, creemos que el plan B es el que puede beneficiar mejor a todos, a los trabajadores y también a los alumnos, a los que pertenecemos a toda la parte escolar. Muchas gracias, para mí ha sido un privilegio estar delante de ustedes en el día de hoy. Gracias. Uh, with a lot of the school board members, and uh, we are, he knows that there's a, a option A and option B, and that he's encouraging the school board members to vote for option B uh, for the health insurance for especially the hourly wage earners. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments pertaining to the budget, what was presented, and the tax rate? Eh, buenas tardes, soy Pastor Rubén Chaires. Eh, represento a Programa también, mi comunidad, y estoy dentro de la Border Organization. Y he escuchado eh, los testimonios, las historias de las personas que trabajan en el distrito, principalmente las personas que ganan eh, por horas, les pagan por horas verdaderamente que es conmovedor. Eh, yo que eh, hablo a nuestra comunidad a través de la radio, siempre tengo abiertos los canales para que eh, se comuniquen y nos eh, compartan eh, sus necesidades. Y estoy aquí, ¿verdad?, este, para eh, apoyar el plan B de lo que es la aseguranza de salud para esos trabajadores que hemos escuchado sus eh, historias, ¿verdad?, este, Quiero agradecerles infinitamente eh, este momento que nos han brindado. Perdón, Reverend Chaires, yo sabía que usted quería a la señora English, pero... <laughs> no, no, casi, casi como no quiso, pero... Uh, he introduced himself as Reverend Chaitis uh, from uh, Primera Iglesia Bautista, also in San Felipe. He's also been part of the uh, board organization meetings uh, that have been hosted over at uh, Principe de Paz. He has heard also the stories. He thanks uh, profusely the school board members that met with, uh, with the board organization and the early wage earners from the school district. Uh, and uh, he has heard the stories. He also has a program, uh, a radio program, and uh, where he shares all the stories. And um, he is, as, men, as a reverend from that church, he is encouraging the school board when it comes to, to vote, to please vote uh, for uh, uh, option B or plan B. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Any other public comments on the budget presentation and the tax rate? Being no further public comments. Ms. Valdez, anything to say before we adjourn it? I just want to say thank you to my staff for all their hard work. Thank you for administration and thank you board members for your guidance. Thank you. Yes, and a big thank you to your staff and, and you for what you do. I know it's not easy. Uh, there, all those numbers and decimals, it's way above me. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. Um, any other final comments from the board before I adjourn this and move on down the list? I just, I just want to thank administration again, all your staff. They always do a wonderful job. Um, I think many years ago I asked like for two workshops. We're now doubled <laughs> the amount of workshops. But um, I think it's, it's been very productive, this, this, these meetings that we've had. I think administration has been open and um, we have, I think all of us have expressed our desires to assist in, in many different areas, um, whether it's personnel or, or whether it's some other item. I, I think administration has been very proactive in, in making adjustments and, and uh, pleasing all the desires of the board members. So I do want to thank administration and everybody involved. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I also want to thank you. Uh, you know, your staff does a wonderful job, not only to make the presentation, but makes it easy for us to understand exactly what it is that you're talking about, especially when we talk about a salary branch and all that type of thing, because that means that if you move anything, it's going to upset everything else. Mathematically, it will change everything. So I really appreciate the fact that you're doing that. As far as the insurance, I, uh, I know it depends on uh, what happens the year before. Hey, there's a lot of illness, a lot of expenditures. It's going to make a change. And I'm glad that you're able to figure it out And because with the help of your staff and the teachers that, that are represented at the different schools that I wish that they would take more part into it because it, it's their insurance. It's not up to the board. It's up to them. We make and then the presentation, then we do the uh, approval. But, but I thank you. I really appreciate the fact that you put in so many hours. And our superintendent for pointing out, uh, you know, we when we talk salary, the biggest portion of it that goes to, to for salaries, the biggest portion of our budget. And I really thank you because um, there's only so much we can do, and there's only so much money, and from there, u utilizing 82% uh, of that makes a lot of difference. So we thank you. Very good. At this time, we will <clears throat> adjourn the public hearing on the budget and tax rate, and we'll move into the special called meeting. So I motion to adjourn that and move to the special called meeting. Is there a second? Mr. Mesa, all in favor? Unanimous carries. Thank you. Nothing to there. That takes us to six reports. A health insurance update. Ms. Valdez. Good evening again. I'm here to present a health insurance update, and I do have, or there are some of the committee members joining us um, that would like to provide uh, some information at the end of the presentation as well. This is the same slide that was included in the public hearing. Uh, so there is a correction where it says uh, employee per month, but the annual contribution for 27-2018 um, that was included in the budget is $5,279.40. The, uh, the following two plans, which are option A and option B, reflect the non-renewal of stop-loss insurance. However, we are working on an RFP for an aggregate stop-loss, which stop, the stop-loss insurance that we um, are proposing to non-renew is an individual stop-loss uh, policy that covers 
um, medical expenses that exceed 225000 as a deductible. The aggregate stop loss would look at the plan as a whole and uh, look at our com total financials, make a recommendation as to what uh, they would cover if our total financials were to exceed that amount. When we, um, throughout the year, as the Health Insurance Committee met, we um, had many discussions as to the different plans, what we call tiers, that exist within our health insurance plan. The first five columns is what our current plan actually looks like, where you have the deductible for the basic plan at 750, uh, no cost to the employee, and then you have different pay rate, different uh, employee contributions if they are on the employee, spouse, employee, children, employee, family. For the high plan, the deductible is 250. Employee only on the high plan is a cost of $180.42. And on the HDHP plan, that is a deductible of 1300 And on the employee only uh, portion, that is free, or n no cost, I should say, I'm sorry. The next section, which is titled Renewal Plan Year, sets up or stages the different uh, plan options or the tiers so that each individual tier would be a self-sustaining plan. So for example, um, if we were to, uh, for example, if we were, were forecasting expenditures of 11.7 million, this is after the removal or less the stop loss, with that, this is what it would cost each plan so that the plans themselves with the employee and employer contribution can sustain themselves for any claims that are brought against each plan. In this comparison, this, in this comparison, we can see where the change between the employee's contribution under their current plan to the recommended cost of employee contribution <coughs> on the renewal plan, this is what it would be the change per, or the increase in cost per, for each employee under each plan. So for example, if we look at the employee plus family, we have 48 uh, employees who have that plan right now. They are currently paying $655.31 a month. Building a sustainable plan model would bring that plan to $1,045.88 or an increase of $390.57. The recommendation is to offer a stipend that is equivalent to the cost of the employee-only plan, which on this option is $119.12, to every employee in the district. And the last column shows what the net change per month would be if everybody in the district would receive that $119.12 stipend. So again, the first five columns, or the, the section under current, is what an employee, what the plan design is currently like, and the cost for each tier. This is the recommendation for each plan to sustain itself individually. The second to the last column would be the increased monthly cost for each plan. And with, the, with a stipend offered for the cost of the employee-only plan at $119.12, this is what the net change would be per plan. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. It doesn't show it on the screen. Let me change the display settings. Oh, I'm sorry. Now you can see it. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Mr. Smith. I'm so sorry. I, I'll uh, repeat the main points. I'm sorry. Um, the model that you're seeing under option A, the, the format is the same for option B. As you can see, this is what we currently, the current cost for employees, depending on what plan they select. These are the number of employees that have these plans. Again, this is their current cost. This is the recommendation for each plan based on a sustainability model. 
where it would uh, where the employee only plan for the basic plan with a deductible of 750 which it would maintain the same deductible your high plan would m uh, maintain the same deductible the HDHP plan would increase by $50 but only because that deductible is set by IRS when we compare the renewal plan cost to what an employee is currently paying on any of the plans this is what this second to the last column reflects by offering a stipend of $119.12, which is the cost for employee only, this would be the net monthly change. Oops, I went one slide too many. This would be the net monthly change per plan. So again, the total uh, plan, <coughs> option A, is to generate $11.7 million. This is um, after the removal of the $0.9 million of stop loss. And Again, if we were to offer a stipend to offset the cost for employee-only insurance of $119.12, we currently have 1,419 employees. That would be $1,352,250 for the time frame of January 2018, which is when the plan starts, to August 31st, 2018, which is the end of, this fiscal, or the, end of the upcoming fiscal year. Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. The recommendation would be to use a fund balance. We have an excess fund balance from the minimum that's required. Oh, I'm sorry. The we're not, we're not being told by it's, it's live on the internet. Yeah, okay, that's fine. I just, then I, will, I apologize for not speaking. Oh. I thought we were out of, so if I need to repeat my question. I, I, I think I can answer the question. Okay. The, we're required to keep a three months operating uh, funds in fund balance or in savings. Beyond those three months of operating costs, we have approximately $10 million in fund balance in excess of the 21, 31 million, uh, give or take uh, a few dollars. It's from that excess fund balance that, um, that we are uh, recommending for a discussion that we take the money. Now that money is not assigned to projects right now. Uh, we had talked about uh, rebuilding um, Garfield with some of that money and possibly uh, Cardwell. Uh, if the board chooses to use the money for the health insurance, then we have to either not have those conversations or talk about borrowing money uh, for, uh, for those projects. Right now they're not assigned. We had had discussions with the board briefly about using that money for those projects. This would obviously change that. Okay, I, th I think it's, I think the board would need to understand the details what of that, maybe in a separate discussion, but to make a, uh, an educated decision, if we're going to do this or this, right, what, what those, it's a decision, right? That could be a critical piece. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because we, we have to move on this, we had talked about the two projects that I had discussed with the board, included Garfield Elementary, uh, reconstructing that to be the new pre-K center, uh, and then using uh, Eastside or I'm sorry, Cardwell then, well, old you said, and repurposing it as a regular elementary. We obviously didn't get uh, into the deep discussions because we were waiting to hear from the grant that we had applied for, which now we have heard, and unfortunately uh, it was not awarded to us. Um, I had asked the board for $40,000 to do the study to determine how much it will cost and how much we could uh, allocate from excess fund balance and then consider the rest borrowing money to do that. 
you know, those were just in the initial stages of conversation. However, having uh, reconstructed buildings before and, and um, understood that, I mentioned to the board uh, that I believe we could do Garfield with the fund balance that we were projected uh, to have in excess, which is the same 10 million that I'm talking to you about today, uh, that we could do that for, um, uh, I think the figure I gave the board was to do it for less than 5 million. Uh, and then the remainder, rebuilding old Cardwell, I, I don't know how much we would have to borrow, but that at that point we would borrow money. Uh, this, however, does remove all of that uh, from the table because we can't commit fund balance to projects for the future, uh, having committed money to the insurance. Yep. It's, I, we could obviously get more detail if I had the actual figures that's, for Garfield. That's fine. So uh, let, let me add a, a couple other questions because you know, what, what we talked about a minute ago was how much did you say annual increment for uh, salaries 1.3% or 1.4%? I can't remember the number. For teachers was a 1.8% general pay increase, and for all other staff, 1.5%. Okay, and so if you take this and you add it to that, that total comp adjustment is going to be what? I do not have that percentage, sir. Yeah, so that you, you add them, to, you cum them together in my mind. Your, your, More than doubles it. Your compensation package, so you're talking about 4% increase. Right. And can the district afford a 4% increase is the question, so. I think, um, I, I think that, oh, I, no, it's not about thinking. I know that the district. Put some things out right. for food for thought. Right. I, I think that the district can afford that if that's the choice of the board to go in that direction. Um, but it, it's a matter of choice. Well, it's a matter of what we prioritize as a school district and as a board of trustees. Okay. That's all I had a question on this one. Okay. Uh, when reviewing option A and um, analyzing the increased costs for the dependent plans, uh, for example, as you can, as I was mentioning, employee and family, you would see a change of uh, $390.50, um, or a net of 271 after we offered a stipend. We also um, requested that option B be developed, where the reduction of the stop loss expense would be um, would be uh, or would assist or minimize the increase on the dependent plans. So I mean, as I mentioned earlier, this is the same format. This is our current model. This is what employees currently pay pay for any of their plans that they select. This would be the recommendation of what it would take to generate the revenues between the employee and the employer contribution for the projected uh, plan expenses of 11.7 million. Again, this would be the change for each plan per month, uh, but when offering a stipend of $156.89, the last column is what uh, individuals would see as the net change per month. So again, the model option B it, the reduction of, or the non-renewal of stop loss was adjusted on the dependent plans to minimize the increase. A stipend of $156.89 for 1,419 employees for January 2018 through August 2018 um, is equal to $1,781,015. Uh, those were the those are the two options or yes the two options that were developed in order to um, show the distribution of what uh, the plans would look like and a projected stipend to help offset those costs. Um, we are recommending a back to work stipend 
And as we were discussing earlier, the excess and fund balance would be what it would assist us in the 17-18 school year um, for the, as we were reviewing the change in the 17-18 plan. For 18-19, uh, we do anticipate a $2 million increase in our local tax collections based on the increase in funding that will, the one-time increase in funding that will be received from the wind farms. And uh, throughout the 17-18 year, um, with the help of the Health Insurance Committee, uh, as Dr. Rose was mentioning earlier, we'd like to create a multi-year plan so that we can uh, do some more long-term, or focus on long-term planning for the health insurance fund and identify opportunities on uh, cost reductions so that we can continue to maintain the same plan design and and um, whatever, or I, see, I hate that I say whatever. When an approval is made by the board, um, which we're recommending on August 31st, Ms. Uh, Laura English already has a calendar developed and we'll share with employees so that information sessions could initiate in the month of September um, so that we can get inf employees informed on all of the plans that are available, and I say all of the plans because there's different models that are available based on the level of deductible that they would like to choose and based on the cost. Again, this is where the communications would start. We would start information sessions. Um, and in October, or the open enrollment is projected to start mid-October and would go through mid-November. Um, we do, like I mentioned, we do have a timeline so that the plan can start on January 1. At, and I also wanted, as I mentioned earlier, that we have a representatives from the Health Insurance Committee that would like to um, share what they, what, their, um, what they would like to see on the options as well. On um, option B. Yes, sir employee and children with the stipend, negative $34.42. Does that mean somebody on that plan will be getting $34 from the district? The net that they would see is a uh, reduction of $34.42 in their total cost. So currently, uh, they pay $287.22 a month. Mm -hmm. um, they would see probably 250 a month. Um, again, based on what the new plan costs, less the less the um, recommended stipend on option B. So, employee children option B. With the stipend, they will pay $122.47 a mm. month for their health insurance? No, sir. Without a stipend, option B, or the second to the last column on option B, is the change between what an employee is currently paying and the recommended renewal plan. So this is the monthly increase that an employee would see if we were to select option B without a stipend. This is the actual increase. This isn't the uh, payment that they would make out of pocket, but the actual increase. And then the next column shows if we were to add a stipend, what the net increase would be per month. So, Mr. Rowe, you're, you're, you're correct. They're going to see a pay increase if you want to look at it that way. Right. The stipend is going to be in excess of what the insurance is going to go up. So an employee who has their children and themselves covered okay, will see uh, an increase of $34.00. A month, obviously, that thirty-four dollars will be taxed, but they they will see um, a net gain. Mm -hmm. A net gain. But yes. the stipends have to be the same across the board. Then my next question is: the legality is that a gift of public funds? No, sir. It, it is a stipend that is approved by the board across the board for every employee. In other words, it work, the stipend works out that it covers the cost of the insurance, but um, but it's an across-the-board stipend to everyone. 
So if somebody was on the HDHP plan with the stipend, they stand to make $75 off the deal. Well, if somebody doesn't have insurance with the district at all, they stand to make $156. That's another way of looking at it. It is a stipend that is not, it, it works out for the health insurance, but it's a stipend that we are giving to every employee uh, across the district. So, so, so theoretically, theoretically, a thousand something people on January 1 could drop our insurance and collect $156 a month? No. <laughs> because you, uh, uh, it's the, what is it called? The Health Care Reform Act? The Health Care Reform Act requires that individuals have health insurance. But I mean, they can be on that alternate plan, right? Well, the alternate plan means that you have coverage elsewhere. Right, so they could have it through. If they have coverage elsewhere, elsewhere. Then, they could, then they could drop our plan and if they have coverage They elsewhere. could have it somewhere else through. Yeah, their spouses. Yes. I could carry my wife and she could make $156 extra. We're offering a return to work stipend of $156, which matches what we're seeing on option B as the employee only cost. You know, which echoes what I talked about earlier, right? It's, it's, it's impacting your total comp. Not that I see a thousand something people doing that, but. It could happen. It would, yeah, no question. Okay. Um, here's a very detailed question. On the basic plan, employee and family, 48 individuals are on that one. Do you know how many are hourly wage owners? No, I do not have that detail, sir. Okay. Anyone else? I got a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Still. Yeah. So, phrase is if somebody else has got a question. Yeah, so I'd like to say something. I, um, everybody needs health insurance and I don't think they're going to opt out and not have insurance. I basically turn down TRS because it's more expensive so my wife is carrying me. And health insurance is getting expensive everywhere. I think when you look at the appraisal district, I mean, we're still trying to find it seems like we change every year. But it's not it's not cheap to find health insurance. And so everybody has to have insurance. I don't think there's going to be an exodus of employees that would opt out on health insurance to make some money. It's very little. You've got to have insurance nowadays. It's, everybody knows. And, and insurance is, health insurance is not cheap anywhere. It's expensive. So let me let me ask my question. What I'm I'm a little bit lost at the the way the pendulum is swung, right? What what we were looking at at options 30 days ago is we were going to ask the the um, employees or the teachers or whoever to pay the burden of the $1,400 a, a year increase. And now we've swung that all the way over to, you no, know, the district's going to cover it 100 percent. Is what, the way I got kind of interpreted, right? And so we didn't consider some balance approach in this, to where we we share the burden between the employee and the district. The the, the discussions that we've had, uh, both publicly and individually, uh, asked us to consider an option that would be at a no cost to the employees. We provided two options here uh, that are no cost to the employees. Uh, 
So based on the feedback that I've had, both individually uh, and collectively, this is what was asked for. But I, as I said earlier, uh, it, it depends on what the board wants to prioritize. Uh, the board uh, could come uh, Thursday when we make this uh, final recommendation, the board could approve the plans that we've developed. The board could choose to cut the stipend in half. The board has choices. We're, we're merely uh, recommending uh, plans for discussion based on the feedback that we have received. Uh, and, and we provided a way to fund these plans, but again, it requires the board to decide what they uh, prioritize. We can do a variation of things. I, I do, I would say that the important, uh, that, that one of the important things that, that I would just encourage the board is, our employees are used to having uh, certain benefits, co-pays, prescriptions, um, limits on, on out-of-pocket expenses, and this is what it's gonna cost uh, to have it. Now, how much the board is gonna prove uh, that, that we pay as a district and employees pay, th those options are the board. We can take that back to work stipend and we can, um, we can implement what y'all finally vote on. But again, the board asked us to provide an option where employees wouldn't be hurt and this is what we've done. Yeah, yeah and, and I'm, I appreciate that, it, it, but I'm, I, I'm just trying to get an understanding how that pendulum swung so far. So the, the, the stipend is going back similar to Mr. Mess's comment. Stipends can go away as, as well as appear. Yes, sir. And so if we come up with a different world, this go, could potentially go away. This is a once a year, this is a one-time return to work stipend. For, for this year, yes, but we've outlined how we can sustain the stipend uh, for at least next year as well, while we consider other cost savings measures that, that we'll, we'll uh, talk about here as we're wrapping up uh, the, the discussion. But yes, sir, if, let's say that next year, uh, because of, of, of um, cost saving measures that we implemented, uh, the overall cost of health care would go down, at least uh, by our plan. Uh, the stipend could very well be decreased by $30 to match the decrease in expenses, uh, or, or less or, or, or more. Or the board uh, could choose to increase it should those expenses increase, but we don't expect that they will, um, and we'll definitely take steps to ensure that. Okay, so to, to, to get back to my original point and get it, get it into a dollar figure, our, our, our normal our normal wage increase per year cost us what in a gross number? Because this is the, the, the first year that we're implementing the TASB salary model across the board, uh, it's different as it was, really as it's been every year. If, if we were not gonna do the TASB, if we would have followed the same salary matrix that we had before, uh, the step increase would generally cost about 800,000 before before the TASB salary model. We, we could count on 800,000 yes. being the cost of the step increase for everybody across the board. Yep, and, and what we talked about earlier was how much? The general pay increase, uh, which includes 1.8% for teachers and 1.5% for all staff is 986,000. Yeah. And the TASB salary study model also includes uh, equity adjustments based on employees' placements within their salary ranges of about 352,000. So the, the models, or the budget that is, uh, that was presented includes a change in payroll of 1.3, or salaries of 1.3 million. Yeah, plus 1.7, this, right? Plus 1.7, I mean this. So that's a that's huge it. difference from anything that we've done in history. Well, um, no. No, because Joshua a few Sigmund years ago, no, so please clarify. No, there was a couple of years. A couple of years ago, we did that real big increase where we brought everybody up real big, 
January and I, of 2016. I know that was... It was over a million dollars. Yeah, just in salary alone before all that other was, was backfilled. Three million bucks. We, we gave the teachers, if I may, Mr. Overflow, we gave the teachers a $2,000 increase. Um, I believe that was my second year superintendent. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next year we gave them the step increase plus... I think it was 500 $480. So as far as raises go, um, this would not be something we haven't done before, uh, but it also isn't the practice of something we do every year either. Okay. So how does that work from a tax standpoint? You were saying that uh, you're going to give an employee a stipend, which is taxed at a rate, but then they're going to pay at an insurance premium, which is non-taxable. Yes, sir. So, so because of the insurance costs uh, fall under a cafeteria plan, you don't pay taxes on what you pay for insurance. So it balances out. But the person who falls under the employee and children, because the back-to-work stipend is thirty-two dollars or, I'm sorry, yeah, $34 more, they will pay taxes on that $34. Okay. I don't have any more questions. Can you remind me again about the stop loss, what we will be saving by doing away with what we already had? My fear are the catastrophics and how that might impact the district. Yes, ma'am. The, the stop loss quote that they gave us was a little bit over $900,000. Uh, and at catastrophic costs would uh, hit us hard, uh, except that over the last uh, two years, the vendors, the people that sell a stop loss, have identified lasers. So they haven't been covering catastrophic uh, costs. Now, unexpected catastrophic costs, should they uh, come to pass, then we, then, then we would obviously be responsible uh, for them up, and up to the, the cost of the new insurance that we'll buy, which is the aggregate stop loss. Uh, we, we obviously want to prepare for that. Uh, it, it's not expected, but we would want to prepare for that. We expect that a aggregate stop loss plan based on the numbers that we've seen would not exceed eighty thousand dollars in, in insurance. However, for eighty thousand dollars, you're you're not buying full coverage. You know, you're it, buying. You're, well, um, we don't know the the deductible would then be what what would that be okay in the aggregate fifteen million. Well, it depends on what they would uh, estimate. So the aggregate would be that they would. Uh, provide a total um, a total um, expense proposal or claims activity proposal. If we were to exceed that, which would could be something catastrophic, then they would pay that difference. So they're not looking at it by individual, but they're looking at everybody or the plan as a group. So, so our group, our entire group plan this past year, let's say they paid twelve million, twelve and a half million, right. uh, in in expenses, in the aggregate. They're going to give us a proposal that says if your aggregate increases, and we could set it at 13.5 million, at 14.5, at 15.5. Obviously, the expenses for that insurance goes up, uh, depending on what we set the deductible at. Now, obviously, it'd be set uh, well above 12.5, uh, and then the cost would increase. But it, it's we wouldn't be the first entity to not have stop loss. we would make sure that it was a plan that, that would uh, provide coverage for us uh, in a way that would not exceed any money that we have in excess of fund balance. So how have you calculated for those extra lasers? Those extra unpredicted, unidentified cats that are coming up? All we can do, ma'am, is look at previous practices for insurance um, in the last um, 
I guess we, we looked at the last three years, correct? We looked at the th last three years, and this 11.7 um, includes um, activity from two lasers that we've had before. So this new uh, quote that we received was three lasers. Can and again, say that about three? The, the quote that we received, or the plan that we had in 1617 included two lasers. So those costs were built into, or were used as, um, as our built-in expense uh, when they were generating the forecast. So we have in the 11.7 million, you have individual, I say individuals, but you have costs that were attributed to individuals that, that had high expenses. I think one individual had up to about close to 650,000, which was lasered in uh, 1617. And those are part of the 1617 expenses. <clears throat> those costs though, the 11 point whatever million, were for <coughs> two lasers or did you add one? No ma'am, the, the 11.5 million was for everybody under the plan, including those lasers because- Right, but did you somehow plan for maybe adding one for, for this, this year? For this coming year, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, we did. Okay, that was my question. Now, are there, my second question, the wind farm. We are 100% guaranteed that those taxes <coughs> will be paid. Because if not, that's huge. Well, um, I mean, I'm just wondering, is there an out? Is there an out for them? Yes. Oh. Yeah, they refuse to pay. Or they, they pay. find some kind of loophole and then we're out two point whatever million. There's no loophole uh, that they could find. Could they go bankrupt? Uh, I, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a possibility for any business to go bankrupt. And, um, I, I just don't see that tremendous investment. Of course. <clears throat> <laughs> Those things are built off of, off of uh, programs, right? You, you cannot make a wind farm make business sense without government funds. And, and how does that, you know, what's what's the duration of that i guess it'd be good for a year right they could actually they could actually go bankrupt yeah i think it's this if if the current administration says hey i'm not i'm not in the wind farms they could pull that program in a second and that's not that's not the only reason we're not counting on that income beyond one year there's other reasons why even if it didn't go bankrupt we would not be able to collect those two million. The state is going to level off our funding, and uh, after they have the second year, we would be reducing our funding from TA because of that increased uh, tax collection from them. Um, I just want to better understand how we arrived at going from what we asked the administration to do, which was have no cost, no additional cost uh, out of pocket for our employees, right? So you came back with these wonderful options, right? How did, how did we go to, from 119 to 156? I, I don't understand. Okay. The, the money that we're projecting to save from stop loss okay, in, in the 119 plan, which is an option A, mm -hmm. okay, it, it doesn't redistribute that amount. It just reduces it from the overall cost, and uh, then we assign the back-to-work stipend for everybody at 119. Now, when we do that, the employee and spouse, that one goes up also. So does the employing children and the employing family. If we're looking at, at, at the basic plan on top, all those costs increase in, in, uh, in this coming year. It's not a new plan, there's just increases that, that we're expected to have because of increased costs. So then if we look for a way to reduce those costs for the uh, employing spouse, employing children, employing family, we take the projected savings from the stop loss, which is about 800,000. 
820000 and we redistribute that money within those other plans. But when we redistribute that $800,000, well, then that increases the employee-only um, cost, uh, so we have to increase the stipend. It, it was built in as an option to limit how much the employees would pay those that insure their family members. Yeah, I mean, I'm struggling, as, as um, Mr. Overfield alluded to, with giving that stipend and pocketing that money. Here, here's another option. I mean, that's really, I mean, that's great for the employee. Here, here's another option that, that Diana County Valdez won't recommend and I won't recommend. The other option is to take money directly from fund balance and put it in our budget for this coming year, and then you all would be approving a deficit budget. Uh, but we would take the, and, and that's not, uh, that's not an option. At least that, we would never make that recommendation. And at that point, nobody pockets $33 or, or, or they're covered somewhere else. Nobody sees that increase. But we just don't see ourselves recommending an unbalanced budget. So the plan B is with the savings of the 800000 whatever, for the stop loss that's going to be thrown into the pool. Mm -hmm and distribute it among all plants, not just employee only. Go ahead, Judge. I'm sorry. Thank you. I just want to be sure that everybody understands. I'm all for making sure the employee doesn't pay. I'm just making sure everything is understood before we go down that road. Uh, there. I, I, I don't want to seem as anti-stipend or, or, or the employee needs to pay their share, et cetera. No. I, I want to keep it like it's been. I just want to make sure every option has been looked at and, and questions are, are answered before we move on it. Um, okay, totally lost. Where are we? Um, We're still questions. That we finished okay. the PowerPoint. I know uh, somebody from the committee would like to uh, share some comments, but we have gone through all of the PowerPoint. Again, it includes options A and B, and how we all, we're also going to work on the 18-19 year uh, to create a multi. We're also during the 17-18 year, we're going to create a multi-year plan so that we can uh, identify any other opportunities. And as I mentioned, uh, the choice that is made on Thursday, uh, the following day, we will initiate uh, communications on all the information sessions and the entire. Uh, calendar for any type of information sessions, um, our health fair that's coming up, the open enrollment, so everything will uh, start to be distributed and communicated with employees. Okay, so um, if um, on Thursday, if the recommendation was option B, um, there will be the $1.3 million increase in the budget today, and then a possible $1.7 uh, from fund balance that we would allocate for insurance for this coming year, uh, which is about $4 million out of the $10 million in excess that we have in fund balance, right? Um, or we have, how much do we have extra over, you said? I heard 10. I don't yes, know. it's about 10, but the 1.3 that I mentioned from the TASB salary study, salary study is already part of All right, the budget. It's already budgeted. Yes, yes. So 1.7 from 1. the 10. 7. Uh -huh. Okay. Sorry. Okay. You have a no, I just, okay. I think I think maybe your the insurance committee members might allude to it. You said about the communication sessions. Mm -hmm. um, just, I know you know how how passionate I am about making sure we include everybody in future plans for uh, the insurance. I think it's really, really important at every level. Correct. We, Finding a way to communicate, meet them where they're at. We completely agree, and we did have that discussion as well today with the committee. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Let me ask you. Yeah, kind of confusing, but 
you know, we're, paid, we're going over uh, 2.5 plus. In the uh, in a nutshell, the employees are paying 1.7 through the stipend that, is, that they've been given, right? So our increase is uh, reduced by 1.7. The reduction. I'm talking about the self-funded, but we're paying in addition for this year. I'm looking at uh, option B. I'm talking about uh, the changes from the current money that we're paying, which is uh, from nine million to eleven point seven. Right. So it's a difference of uh, two point five million dollars. Yes, sir. And the uh, and because of the stipend that we're giving the. Uh, employees is going to be reduced by 1.7 it's going to be reduced no sir it's not going to be reduced the uh, increased cost the increased cost sorry the change in employee costs as you can see here in uh, the second to the last column yeah, I'm talking about the bottom correct um, the 1.7 million the 1.7 million is taking the cost of the employee only plan and providing a stipend so that they have a free plan. As you can see, some of these other plans do have a cost. So for example, if you look at the high plan, um, if uh, employees opt to stay on that plan, which is the lowest, I, I would say the, uh, it's a low number of employees that are on that plan, but if they opt to stay on that plan, they will be paying more per month. Yes, and I can see the, the uh, being variable. But my question really, uh, Doc, I, I don't want dropping the uh, stop loss. How is, how is it helping us? What if uh, we have more than one or two laces? And how are we going to pay for that money, the difference? It, obviously, we're, we're uh, looking at prior year's practices uh, where our lasers or our the amount of money that the insurance has refunded us is nowhere near the $0.9 million. Uh, we can't predict what every year is, is going to cost in terms of catastrophic uh, charges. We're just making um, an assumption based on what we have recovered from the insurance in the last three years. And in the last three years, last year we paid half a million and recovered absolutely nothing. So we lost half a million dollars if we can look at it that way. The year before that, uh, we probably paid 350000 but we did recover all but about $40,000 of it. So that was a good trade-off. But that was the only year. Yeah. I can see it now. I just forgot about that. So in other words, uh, if it goes up a lot more the laces, then they're not going to pay us anyway. Correct, and, and they did identify an additional laser for this yeah, coming okay. year and double the cost. Appreciate it. Yeah, you can do the. At this time, if you would like to share. At this time, as a committee member and some of us a fellow colleagues here as uh, members would like to recommend um, option B for our board to consider it on this Thursday. Uh, as uh, Mrs. Yanakani has said, we did uh, express ourselves to uh, include more of the individuals that did, were not present but did have representat representation at the time. Uh, we did stress that very much uh, before we uh, ended our meeting and uh, if most of the ones that were there and had uh, as voted on the option B and were there most of the meetings the majority of them were there for the meetings with the education that they Ms. Yanakani and Mrs. Uh, English uh, brought to us. Anyone else from your committee want to say anything? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Miguel Salinas, Jr. I'm also a member of the insurance committee, and I am, well, 
being a member of the committee and employee here at the school district. And I'd like to echo the sentiments of my fellow committee members that we do want option B. The reason we want option B is because it covers everyone fairly. We're not seeing a change from previous years. And to echo Dr. Rios and other committee members, Mrs. Valdez, Mrs. English, the trade-off there with getting rid of the, uh, the stop loss, you know, we're paying all that money and we're not seeing that benefit. We're here, we're seeing that benefit. You're keeping the employees with the coverages, with the plans that they've had, with what they've grown used to, and you're having a, uh, a happy, you know, a happy workforce. And I'd like to say here and iterate that coming from outside of the school district, one of the reasons I wanted to join and be a part of the school district is out there in what I'll call the real world, you have the uh, insurance premiums, as Mr. Overfeld had alluded to, they're outrageous, and at times they're egregious. Before I came here, I was paying just for myself right around $400 a month. That's just to cover me, with a deductible of right around $6,000. And that's no co-pays, no anything. I'm responsible for everything up to $6,000. So I can tell you that that was part of why I wanted to come here and stay here in Del Rio, stay here at this school district, because if I moved back to San Antonio, yes, I could get a job somewhere over there as a you know, as many people could, but this is a huge benefit to the workforce, is having this type of insurance, because you won't find this really anywhere else here in town. You know, and I've looked, and I'll also add, I am, uh, still am a licensed insurance agent with both property and casualty and life and health insurance. So I look at this through a different, through a different lens. I'm able to see here that this is, you know, a fantastic plan. I'd like to say, you know, for the record, this is a fantastic insurance and benefits, uh, health benefits package. And that everybody here on the committee, Mrs. Valdez, Ms. English, Dr. Rios has done a fantastic job and we look to do a fantastic job moving forward so that way we can kind of mitigate these changes to be able to say, okay, for the next year and the year after that, this is more or less what we'd like to do and I'd like to stay on the committee to you know, see that through. But this is a fantastic plan and that's what I wanted to say and that option B is really the, the way to go, I'd like to say. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Good to go. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. There is nothing on a consent agenda, nothing under administration, nothing under instruction, technology and operations that takes us to eleven business and finance. Consideration to approve the 2017-2018 district compensation plans. Ms. Valdez. Good evening again. The compensation plans that were included in the district budget are for the teacher, administrative professional, paraprofessional, auxiliary. Our stipend schedule, the value of our stipend schedules have not changed, but we've reorganized our stipend schedule to have a stipend schedule that shows stipends that are for just for teachers. Um, then we have supplemental stipends and athletic stipends. We also offer uh, what we call temporary stipends, which is the substitute and the summer school, uh, and some, sorry, the substitute and extra duty, and then the summer school stipend. Um, included in your packet, as I mentioned, we have all of the salary structures uh, that were that was recommended by TASB. These were presented back in May. All of our <clears throat> our budget does include all of these different models. Um, and as I mentioned, we do have the value of our stipend schedules did not change. Um, however, we did create a stipend schedule that shows all of the stipends that we offer to just teachers. Uh, in the past, it was one stipend schedule for everything that we offered. Um, so we, we looked at what other districts have and, and wanted to clean it up so that it looked it was uh, easier for teachers to find what stipends are available for them. Uh, so the format of the stipend schedules is the only change uh, um, to the stipends. But there was no change in the stipend values. Um, and again, these are the salary structures that were recommended by TASB. Are there any questions? On the stipend, the SACS certification uh, for, for dual credit. Um, yes. It's, it's on the first page there. It's um, $5,000 stipend. Was it 8000 at one point or has it always been 5000 
It's always been 5,000 under the EEIP grant. The only ones that were $8,000 is the one that's titled signing bonus, uh, which we presented, I believe, back at the July board meeting. That had an $8,000 stipend for uh, anyone that was hired under that signing bonus categories that were hired by August 31st. So these plans are for 9-1 and future, so that line item was removed from the signing bonus and staff retention. And these uh, compensation plans will be posted on the HR website uh, tomorrow. So we already have the package ready uh, to be posted on the website on, in PDF format. I just have a question, yes, just for clarification. On the stipends by position, were these compared to other districts or did TASB give input on these? In this salary study, uh, we did not have a stipend salary study, but we do plan on including one in this upcoming maintenance plan with TASB. It just seems that, obviously, the time and energy and effort that um, it takes to actually take on the additional responsibilities do not seem to be equally compensated. So uh, I'd be very interested to see what has people would come back and say. And, and I do plan on including that in there. We, uh, as I mentioned before, when we last, when we did the last HASBE salary study, we mentioned that we would maintain a maintenance plan. Um, and this year we focused on, on all of our salary structures. So this next year, of course, they will continue to maintain our salary structures now that we are on completely on TASB salary structures, but we'll ask them to work on uh, stipends. <clears throat> we, we did have that that conversation uh, with, with TASB, and, and what they uh, chief pointed out was that to compare it to other districts, what they've encouraged other districts to do is to build it into uh, the salary where it was a fixed salary uh, for certain positions. Um, for example, your band directors. Uh, your your tennis coaches and and, and they, she shared some of what had been done uh, in in other districts. We just uh, weren't ready for that, um, so we'll discuss it this coming year. I, I know that it it um, it'll have more discussion. Um, I, I also believe that if we would have had that discussion this year, we wouldn't have been able to afford it. Mm -hmm. We presented a balanced budget, and so this this is part as far as we could go this year. Thank you. Any questions on <laughs> compensation before I ask for the recommendation? Um, I've been sitting here just trying to listen and take everything in. I appreciate your time, Anna Connie, with your staff as well. But um, I'm not too comfortable with the, the longevity conversation at all. I mean, I've been sitting here trying to contemplate, and we have teachers that have been here for years. And I absolutely agree with Mr. Messet. And then that $300 doesn't set well with me at all. But. I don't, I mean, if we need to discuss it a little longer, or try to find another means, I don't know if that's possible, but it doesn't set well with me at all. Um, I know you've explained it. I'm not keen on numbers and percentages and all that, but it doesn't set well with me. If, if I may. The, the the problem with the with changing the the, the TASB compensation model that, that we started working on since last year at this time, because it's a whole packet, you know, we would not be offering um, the thousand dollars plus the additional money for the teachers in step one through nine 
unless it's a whole package deal. Because obviously we're looking to balance uh, what teachers are making across all steps. And, and that's, you know, that's why we, we, we talked about capping salaries more than 12 months ago. And, and, and the board uh, understood the plan then. Now today it affects 12 teachers, but it affects 12 teachers very respectfully who are being paid above the market. It was they're getting paid more than what they would pay, get paid in other districts. So therefore they get a lesser uh, increase, a significantly lesser increase, uh, uh, I agree. If we, were to, if we weren't gonna do that, then we'd have to change the salary for everybody else across the board so it would match up to our budget. Uh, I'm not saying that these 12 teachers aren't deserving of it. I'm just saying that these 12 teachers are making above the market, making above what they would make in other districts, and we're trying to fix everybody's salaries so that not only can we retain people, but we can also recruit people you know, to come to the district. And it's a difficult choice. Uh, I understand that. But I also would caution the board that at this point, trying to make a change uh, on something that we've discussed for more than 12 months uh, would really halt this whole process. Thank you, Dr. Rios, and I do understand, but I just needed to be clear that it doesn't set well with me. And I do understand, and we have you know, talked about it quite a bit, but it doesn't set well. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Samosa? Uh, to echo what, what Amy said, I know it's, you know, we can't do it this year, but certainly would be good to look for next year. I think um, experienced teachers deserve a little bit more than that, certainly a lot more. Uh, I know we capped their salaries, but we are trying to retain teachers, and so it would benefit that goal of retaining teachers that are experienced. But somehow that amount, you know, it just is not an incentive to keep. Um, I do recommend that we will take a close look at it for next year and see what we can do as an entire board, not just, you know, one board member. Or but I think, you know, for the benefit of the experienced teachers, we do need to look at it. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approves the 2017-2018 district compensation plans. For the recommendation, I so move. Is there a second? Mr. Chavita. Any other discussion? All in favor? Well, I'm sorry. But I just had one quick question because I just noticed here. Okay. On football head coach under the athletic stipends, it says stipend negotiable. So technically... That stipend that's listed here doesn't really apply. I didn't hear the question. No, Sorry. I'll answer it. Okay. The verbiage on stipend negotiable was put in for when we bring in a new coach. Um, we can change it to leave it as what it's written because we're not intending on negotiating up or down on it. Uh, that was changed probably seven, eight years ago. Uh, but the stipend that is written on there, uh, it's it's one he's receiving right now. Is that correct, Ms. Valdez? I think the stipend he's receiving right now is higher because he negotiated a higher amount. Um, but th this um, table didn't change. So his uh, so I want to say his stipend was negotiated back, I don't know when, maybe two years ago at a different amount. When, when we redid his salary, uh, and, and it was a discussion with this board. Uh, we can recess and, and get the exact amount if, if y'all would. Yeah, I mean, that's, I guess I just had never noticed that. So, so this, the stipend amount really should be blank oh, and that's, say that's stipend negotiable. Okay. I mean, that's my suggestion. Cause, and, and, and we'll make that update. Because it's not true. I mean, this is, I mean, you won't say anything. Yeah, I, I, I mean, to point. be correct? Yes. Yes, thank you. That, that's all. Okay. Thank you. I guess I have a first and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor? 
Unanimous carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, B, consideration to approve the 2017-18 district official budget, Ms. Valdez. Thank you again. The 2017-2018 budget was prepared in a timely manner in accordance with sections 44.001 through 44.006 of the Texas Education Code and in compliance with uh, policy CE legal and CCG legal. Um, again, the notice of public meeting to discuss the budget and proposed tax rate was published in the Daryl News Herald on August 20, 2017. The total estimated uh, revenue and expenditure for 2017-2018 for general fund is 84 million. 348,923 and the general fund budget includes the following state program allotments. The 2017-2018 debt service is budgeted with the estimated revenue and expenditures of 4,094,904 and the food service budget has an estimated revenue of 6,028,569 and expenditures of 6 million 58,282 with a deficit of 29,713. The 2017 2018 total combined district official budget revenue is 94,472,396 and the expenditure budget is 94,502,109. The uh, district official budget will be posted on our district transparency page. And included in your packet is the uh, executive summary of the district official budget that shows the budget that is approved at the functional level for each of the executive funds. Any questions before I call for the recommendation? Recommendation. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approves the 2017-2018 district official budget, which includes the general fund budget, the debt service budget, and the food service budget. For the recommendation, is there a motion to approve? Mr. Chavia, second by Mr. Mesa. Any other discussion? All in favor? Unanimous carries, thank you. Thank you. See consideration to adopt the 2017-18 ordinance setting the MNO tax rate at 1.040000 and the INS tax rate at 0 0.119800 for a total tax rate of $1.159800. Uh, $1 Thanks about you. this. <laughs> Um, on August 14, the board approved a proposed tax rate that was included in the uh, required public posting with a tax rate of uh, 1.1598. The uh, section 2605 of the property tax code includes the steps required for adoption of the budget. Uh, if you look at the ordinance setting the tax rate, which is on the next page, I'll read the ordinance. August 28, 2017, on this date, the Board of Trustees of San Felipe del Rio Consolidated Independent School District hereby levy or set the tax rate per $100 valuation for the district for the tax year commencing on the first day of September 2017 and ending on the 31st day of August 2018 at a total tax rate of 1.159800 to be assessed and collected by the duly specified assessor and collector as follows. 1.04 for the proposed maintenance and operation and points 1198 for the purpose of payment of principal and interest on debt. I move that the property tax rate be increased by the adoption of a tax rate of 1.1598, which is effectively a 1.54% increase in the tax rate the total tax rate did not increase, but using the tax calculations um, that are recommended by the state, they calculate an effective tax rate, which is a tax rate that you would effectively need to maintain the same level of operations. That's where this 1.54% uh, comes in. This year's levy to fund maintenance and operations expenditures exceeds last year's maintenance and operation tax levy. So since we had a 0.59% increase, to our um, taxable property values, that increases the levy that we are taxing on. 
So again, this tax rate will raise more taxes for maintenance and operation than last year's tax rate. Even though this is the same tax rate with the increase in our taxable values, when you apply our total tax rate to a higher tax levy, you will generate more tax dollars. That's what this statement is saying. Uh, such taxes are to be assessed and collected by tax officials designated by the district. So San Felipe del Rio CISD adopted a tax rate that will raise more taxes for maintenance and operations than last year's tax rate. So again, the same tax rate when applied to a higher levy will raise more taxes. This is the wording, that exact wording that we have to use based on uh, the state's guidance of, uh, of property tax code. Sounds good. I know. Every year I read the same, same statement. <laughs> Any questions? Recommendation. Thank you. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the ordinance for the fiscal year commencing on the first day of September 2017 and ending on the 31st day of August 2018, setting the MNO tax rate at 1.04 and the INS tax rate at 0.1198 for a total tax rate of 1.1598. For the recommendation, I so move. Is there a second? Mr. Hermesa. Any other discussion? All in favor? Unanimous carries. Thank you. Thank you. 12 Human Resources Consideration to Approve Employee Job Description and Evaluation Forms. Ms. Ida Garcia. Good evening, Mr. Oberfeld, Dr. Rios, members of the board. In your packet, we included two job descriptions and evaluations, which were the custodial coordinator and maintenance coordinator. These were um, updated and revised to include the report two, and it would be the construction manager. duplicated in the stipend budget stuff and didn't have the descriptions in hers. We apologize for that. Do you want, I could give you my copy. I'm Josh. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions on any of these two items? Well, let me go over those right quick. The maintenance is still outsourced, or no? What, what's outsourced? The landscaping, right? Lawn, lawn care. Lawn care only. Yes, okay. So this, in essence, will just help the construction manager manage the daily operations of whatever. Uh, is that this just changes uh, the wording of who the maintenance coordinator reports to. Uh, that's it. Uh, it doesn't talk about the construction manager's job description. We're only doing the maintenance coordinator and, and the custodial to indicate that they report to the construction manager. Recommendation. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the employee job description and evaluation forms as discussed. Further recommendation, I so move. Is there a second? Ms. Haynes, any other discussion? All in favor? Unanimous, thank you. 14 closed session. The board will now move into closed session. The final vote is required on any matter considered in closed or executive session. It shall be taken either upon reconvening of the public session covered by this notice or a subsequent duly posted public meeting as the board shall determine. Tonight, pursuant to 551.074, discussion of personnel or to hear complaints against personnel and 551.071, private consultation with the board's attorney. Discussion of personnel report to include new hire, district vacancies, retirement resignations, reassignments. Discussion of salary adjustments to include but not limited to the following justifications of service credit, master's degree, stipend, salary, matrix adjustments. Three, discussion of assistant principal position and pursuant to 551.071, private consultation with the board's attorney, report and advice from the council regarding the Laughlin Air Force Base lease. 
Again, all final votes will be taken in open sessions. Now 8.16 p.m. We are in closed session. It is 8.55 p.m. This board will reconvene into open session. No action was taken. A, consideration to approve personnel report to include the following new hires, district vacancies, retirements, resignations. Ms. Garcia. Mr. Overfield, Dr. Rios, members of the board, administration proudly recommends the following new hires. Fatima Martin del Campo for Lonnie Green, fourth grade teacher. Cecilia Lopez Garandilla for Lonnie Green, third grade teacher. Roxanne Samaripa at Garfield, first grade teacher. Bianca Flores for Lamar Elementary, fifth grade teacher. Isabel Santillan Guerrero, North Heights Elementary, fourth grade teacher. Summer Almaguer, Del Rio Middle School, ELA teacher, and Ileana Castillo, Del Rio Freshman School, dance teacher. Per the recommendation, I so move. Is there a second? Ms. Haynes, Mr. Smith. Uh, all in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Uh, no salary adjustments? No, sir. No, so nothing under item B. C, consideration to approve the assistant principal position. Yes. Yes, sir. It is a recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve Ms. Sharon Fernandez as assistant principal at Del Rio Freshman School. Further recommendation, is there a motion to approve? Mr. Chavita, seconded by Ms. Lozano. All in favor? Six in favor. Opposed? One abstention. Passes. Uh, D. Laughlin Air Force Base lease, Dr. Rios. Mr. Overfelt, members of the board, it is a recommendation of the administration that the board approve the changes to the lease and instruct council to complete any final negotiations as necessary. Further recommendation, I so move. Is there a second? <coughs> Plenty of seconds, uh, Ms. Haynes. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor? Unanimous carries. Thank you. 16 superintendent's report, August 31st, 2017, final 0617 board meeting. Yes, Mr. Overfelt, members of the board. We have our final meeting on August 31st. Uh, at that uh, time, we will present uh, any committed funds. Uh, Ms. Valdez will uh, either, she's already placed on your desk, will be handing you the list of committed funds that we will discuss this coming Thursday. I have the um, fund balance that we, or estimated fund balance that we will be available. I don't have the list completed yet. Okay. But that's what I'll be part of. And the 31st will also be the decision on the insurance. Uh, yes, that includes uh, the, the committed funds from, from fund balance. Uh, and it's not on the Agenda, but just as a reminder that Wednesday at 7 p.m. we have a community pep rally at uh, Ram Stadium. Community pep rally Wednesday at 7, and then the final meeting at 6 p.m. here in the SPC for budget amendment thing. Being no further business before this board, is there a motion to adjourn? Ms. Lozano, seconded by myself. All in favor? Unanimous. 8.59 p.m. Thank you.